Well, good afternoon if you are on the East Coast of the United States. Good morning if you are further West. Good evening if you are in places such as Hamburg, Paris, Milan, Helsinki, St. Petersburg, <laughs> Vienna, among the places that we'll be talking about today with my guest, who I will tell you about in a moment. I'm Fred Plotkin. This is Fred Plotkin on Fridays on Idajo, the place where classical music and opera happen. Idajo, as you know, is a video and audio streaming platform dedicated to supporting artists and to making classical music and opera available to fans around the world. Those of you who have joined me since April 24th of 2020 for these weekly conversations know that I began them by asking people to join me who really inspire me. Everyone I've had inspires me to a greater or lesser degree, but today's guest is, he's sort of the Mozart, the Beethoven, he's the the Bach of inspiration. His name is Harvey Sachs. And what he does for his work is the stuff that gives me nourishment in so many ways. Harvey is a musicologist, a scholar, a brilliant author. And I say that because not everybody who knows music or any topic knows how to write about it in a way that's engaging and appealing and inspiring. And Harvey has done that for a very long time. Well, before I met him, uh, I was reading all of his books. I guess it's fair to say that he is the world's leading expert on the conductor Arturo Toscanini, and maybe we'll talk about him a bit today. But um, you can find something I did with Harvey a few years ago at the Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimo of New York University. Uh, you go to vimeo.com and you just enter Fred Plotkin, Harvey Sachs, S-A-C-H-S. But he's also written about Beethoven, about uh, Placio Domingo. He was the co-author of Domingo's autobiography of the first 40 years. I guess it's time for the next one. Uh, George Schulte's memoirs, everything about music and always in a way that makes you want more. It, it's a very full meal when... Uh, you're dining at Harvey's uh, intellectual table, but you always come away wanting more, which is a good thing. So Harvey, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. And as it happens, Harvey has a new book, which is not about Arturo Toscanini. Um, it is 10 Masterpieces of Music. And it just came out, right? It's really quite new. Yeah, end of October. Mm -hmm. End of October. So, Harvey, this is the first book I've read in which one senses that we live through a pandemic. Not because you wrote about the pandemic, but I have, I mean, when did you start it? Because in one of the chapters, I think it was about Prokofiev, you spoke about the fact of being confined and not able to go out and perform and it's something that Prokofiev, because of war and, and revolution and so on, faced at a certain point. So when did you begin this and to what degree was the pandemic an influence on how you approach this book? Well, I began the book, um, I think, about three years ago, something like that, mm -hmm. two and a half, three years ago. And, uh, you know, it, it made progress slowly for a while. When the pandemic hit, then it really began to make progress more quickly because, you know, I mean, as it is, writers uh, are used to sitting in front of their desks, in front of their computers or whatever they use nowadays, and, uh, and concentrating on their work. And uh, so that was nothing new for me because I don't go to the office for work. My home is my office. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, the increased degree of, of confinement meant, you know, why not just concentrate on this? So basically, I think I had done uh, two chapters or so of the book before the pandemic. And then during the pandemic, I did all the rest and I finished it 
uh, I think uh, late November, early December last year, about a, just about a year ago. And uh, so that's the that's the story from that side of the. And do you feel it informed it in any way? I ask because um, one of my books, Classical Music One Hundred and One, I was <laughs> writing around the year two thousand and two thousand and one, and I happened to be writing a chapter about Mahler's Second Symphony on September eleventh, two thousand and one, when there were the attacks in the World Trade Center and in Washington and Pennsylvania. And to write about resurrection, to write about grappling with issues of calamity and so on, in that particular piece of music, when, as it happened, we were experiencing that in life, I couldn't help but feel it enter my writing. And I guess I'm wondering, did the pandemic in any way, not that you wrote about the pandemic, you mentioned it once, but did it enter your writing in terms of your approach to your composers and their and their lives that you wrote about? You wrote about 10 composers. Mm. I don't really think so. I think maybe the general atmosphere I felt in some way, uh, I'm sure I did. And so in that sense, it might have subliminally influenced me, but I don't think it did outright. Mm -hmm. um, I did, as you said, I mentioned that Prokofiev during the First World War was confined and very antsy to get a move on somehow mm -hmm. or other because he had just launched his career. You know, in 1914, he was uh, 23 years old and, you know, he was eager to, to really start performing all over the place and yeah. having his works performed all over the place. And of course... For the following four years, he was basically uh, constrained to remain at home in, in St. Petersburg. So um, that's how I mentioned that, you know, young artists today uh, could well understand how he felt at that time. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I don't think there was anything, you know, a, a direct influence on what I was writing uh, by the pandemic. So your book is called 10 Masterpieces of Music. And I want to quickly put out of the way something that you put out of the way in the book. These are not the 10 best pieces of music ever written. We wouldn't dare waste our time doing such a list. It's pointless. It's not a listicle that you read in, in a you know newspaper, the, the 10 greatest classical music pieces. No. Um, I'm going to ask you in a moment your approach to how you pick these 10. Uh, I will name the composers, uh, Mozart, Beethoven, Schubert, Schumann, Berlioz, Verdi, Brahms, Sibelius, Prokofiev, Stravinsky, all great. And did you first approach the, the selection by picking the type of music you want, in other words, uh, a song cycle, an opera, a string quartet, a symphony, a concerto, and so on. Did you first say, well, we must have Mozart and Beethoven and, and Verdi? How did you form your list? You know, it's hard to say. I think it sort of came together in a way, catch as catch can. Um, I wanted to write about pieces that I loved. That was first criterion. Uh, the um, uh, contract that I had with my publisher meant that it had to be limited to 10. Mm -hmm. And in the end, I'm very glad that it was because I'd probably still be writing it now if it had had yeah. many more composers in it. Um, so, you know, a few of the composers I knew absolutely I wanted to include. There were a couple of others whom I would have liked to include, like, for instance, Chopin and WC and Bartok, but uh, I just couldn't accommodate more. And so, uh, and also, I did want to have ten different types of composition in the in the uh, table of contents. I I wanted to to um, not have you know three string quartets or two symphonies. Um, I wanted there to be diversity in the uh, in the selections. 
So when you're deciding, for example, you wanted a piano concerto, you pick Mozart's uh, concerto number 17, Kirschel 453 from the year 1784. Um, did it, is it because you love that more than other piano concerti or did it particularly fill a niche in what you intended to teach your reader or because obviously many of the composers on this list wrote piano concerti, not all of them, but mm. most of them. And there are many, many others, Tchaikovsky, for example, who are not on this list, who you could have chosen. And it, this is a wonderful piano concerto, but how did it, for example, arrive that for the piano concerto, you went to Mozart? Hmm. I'm not sure that I can actually answer that question. I mm -hmm. don't remember. I mean, this is a concerto, I can tell you that among Mozart's piano concerti, of which there are at least 10 that I absolutely adore, mm -hmm. uh, this was one that um, I find particularly moving, um, not only delightful and profound, but very moving. And especially the second movement, which is the movement that I... I think concentrated on more than the others, <clears throat> at least to some extent. Um, so I think I just decided, you know, that that was, that was the one I wanted to do. I don't think, uh, I mean, Beethoven's Piano Concerti, for instance, have been all very thoroughly discussed and written about, of course, so have Mozart's, but I felt that this particular concerto, perhaps I would have something to say about it that other people hadn't said already. And in it's, fact, you know, that, that in a way is that was the criterion for the other pieces as well. Um, you know, that, that um, maybe I had something to say about each of them that hadn't already been said since mm -hmm. they're all, or most in any case, fairly well-known pieces of music. I'm going to read a paragraph from your preface. Another important criterion was my wish to choose 10 pieces, 10 different genre of pieces. Thus, there are works for various numbers of performers. One, a piano sonata. Two, a song cycle for solo voice plus piano. Three, a piano, violin, cello trio. Four, a string quartet. Five, a string quintet a symphony orchestra, and an orchestra plus one solo instrument. Also included are a religious work for orchestra plus chorus and vocal soloists, an opera, and a composition that defies categorization, although it is sometimes performed as an oratorio and sometimes as an opera. And that's Berlioz's La Damnation de Faust. And if readers read no other chapter in the book they have to read that one we're going to get to Hector in a, in a little while um I didn't know that you knew him personally Hector oh, you know. <laughs> Berlioz is the only composer I refer to by his first name <laughs> I have an incredibly strong affinity and okay so I'm going to raise a question now about not about Berlioz but about composers in general but the fact that I feel this particular intimacy and connection with Berlioz um I have a very dear friend in Stockholm, and when I was there a few years ago, I had tickets to go see Le Nozze di Figaro and Don Giovanni at the Royal Swedish Opera, which is a wonderful theater and a wonderful ambiance, and the Swedes are very chic without trying to be, and they have lovely restaurants there, and it's a beautiful experience to go to the opera in Stockholm, and I called up Stephen ahead of time, and I said, listen, I have these great tickets to hear some Mozart at the Royal Opera. And there was silence at the end of the phone. And I said, what's the matter? He said, well, I don't have the Mozart gene. And this is a very cultured, sophisticated guy. I respect him a lot. But he doesn't, and I'm not criticizing him, he doesn't feel Mozart. There's just something that doesn't connect. I have really come to believe that our connections to music come on many levels. And we're going to talk about that with your book, but one of them is a purely physical response that we have that each one of us connects to different things. 
My father loved Debussy, Ravel, Gershwin, Stravinsky. In other words, he was born in 1923. Um, people who were active or, or almost active when he was a boy. So the first music he heard, a little Puccini, but less so, um, Duke Ellington, those were the musicians he liked and the music he responded to. I almost immediately responded very well to Haydn, but much more viscerally to two composers, to Berlioz and to Rossini. And I'm not talking about the content of the work, I'm talking about the sound, the architecture, and I'm not speaking as a musicologist, I'm speaking on, a, on the most physical level possible, that the first time I heard something by Berlioz, I just was stopped in my tracks. And same with Rossini. And yes, there are many other composers who are as good, but these two, I have the Berlioz gene, I have the Rossini gene. Um, does this kind of thing make sense to you? And I'm not going to ask you unless you want to volunteer if you have a gene for a particular composer <laughs> or more than one, or if there's a composer you don't have the gene for. Um, <clears throat> yeah, um, my experience, I'm sure, was different uh, than yours because um, nobody in my family listened to classical music. And um, it came to me when I was about 12 um, I mentioned this in the preface to my book also, you know, that uh, we had a family friend who was a violinist in the world famous Cleveland Orchestra. I grew up in, I was born and grew up in Cleveland. Um, and uh, he started taking me to rehearsals and performances of the Cleveland Orchestra. And, um, and this came just at sort of pre-puberty and everything started started me going on it. Uh, certainly the first composer who made the most tremendous impression on me was Beethoven. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And remains, you know, sort of a paradigm for me. Um, Mozart came later, I have to say, because it's a whole different and much more subtle in a way uh, yeah. sort of thing. Um, Likewise, opera for me came later, generally speaking. Uh, I was, because my first experience of great music was orchestral instrumental music. And so, and Cleveland did not have an opera company of its own. And I wasn't exposed to opera until really later. So, um, you know, these things happen sort of by accident and, um, yeah, there are certainly composers whose music I don't feel any great uh, sympathy for. A lot of the late romantics like Bruckner and Mahler, for instance, and even, if I dare say so, Wagner, um, I, admire, I, I, I admire them, and there is some of their music that I love, but I'm not, a, uh, you know, this is, they are not on my top... Mm -hmm. 20 list, let's say. Um, I think maybe I have more classicist <laughs> tendency. Well, someone who did not appear in your book, who I guess could have, who is in this time frame is Richard Strauss. And maybe there just was not a musical form you wanted to address, you felt he was more emblem emblematic of. Strauss is someone that is loved by people who love certain lush melodies. He's loved also by people who are, are musicologically oriented and are fascinated by orchestration. Um, and I'm not saying that you should have included Strauss because I greatly respect Strauss and the works of his that I absolutely adore and others that I don't care much about. But um, you for the so-called modernist or the new era, you had Sibelius, Prokofiev, and Stravinsky, all of them exceedingly valid. And particularly your Sibelius chapter was very fascinating and impassioned in ways. I happen to be a big friend and fan of Finland, and I've spent a great deal of time there and adore <clears throat> Finnish contemporary music, which you also addressed in your chapter. Um, 
but I want to go back to this. Actually, what I'd like to talk to you about is Cleveland. For people who are listening outside the United States, you may not know that we talk about the traditional big five orchestras. We've grown beyond that because the LA, Los Angeles Philharmonic, San Francisco Symphony, there are many other orchestras that are not in the traditional big five, which are, I try to do it alphabetically, Boston, Chicago, Cleveland, New York, and Philadelphia. All of them august old organizations and music lovers in America argue endlessly as to which one is the best of the five right now. And you know, they go up and down in evaluations all the time. Um, but very often it's the Cleveland Orchestra that's ranked number one. I was late to Cleveland. I didn't get there until about three or four years ago. And I went for a visit and I went to the magnificent Severance Hall, which is a gorgeous place and heard Mahler, Mahler Fourth Symphony, the orchestra was, I've heard them many times in New York, but they were amazing in their own hall. Um, yes, there's not much of a Cleveland opera company. There's a play called Lend Me a Tenor by a writer named Ken Ludwig, who um, it's a comedy and it's about the Cleveland opera that didn't really exist, about the, com the people locally trying to stage an opera and um, the tenor didn't show up. They needed a new tenor. And it is a comedy, it is, it's very funny. But this goes into a bit of the history of opera in the United States. The Metropolitan Opera was founded in 1883 and from its first year began to tour around the country. And it established a tour and Cleveland was always one of the stops. Right. And certain cities such as Boston and Cleveland that had great symphonies, did not immediately develop an opera tradition. Chicago did in fits and starts. The company was finally founded in 1954. San Francisco founded its company in 1923. But the second oldest opera company in America happens to be in the same state, Ohio, as Cleveland, namely that Cincinnati Opera, mm -hmm. who was founded in 1920. It's a wonderful company. Used and therefore- the zoo. Yes, they performed in a zoo and now they have the music hall again. It's from 1870s. There's a fantastic tradition in Cincinnati and Ohio in general for music. Um, great conservatories, great many great musicians come out of Ohio. And I think even though population wise, it is a large state, it's not a physically large state. Um, it punches way above its weight in terms of its impact on music and certainly opera and classical music with the notable exception that Cleveland never really had much of an opera. It's a very large city. It's yeah. a city that has many ethnicities, has the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, is very deeply devoted to music. And also has a, it also, if I may interrupt, it has a great, one of the great art museums in the country. It does. It has a wonderful public library system, which I took advantage of every week uh, while mm -hmm. I was growing up. It has a lot, a lot going for it in, in that sphere. But, you know, you mentioned- And one more thing, the yeah. food market, the West Side Market <laughs> is one of the great food markets I've ever encountered in America because that it's not- after, after my time there. Well, I mean. it's, it's pretty old actually. I'm not oh, saying you're old, but I'm saying it's there a I long am. time. Um, <laughs> No, it's a purpose-built building with beautiful design. And what I loved about it is it's not sort of a trendy market with the latest this or that. It has things like dairies and buttermilk. I, I tasted buttermilk for 35 cents there in the market three years ago, fresh from the, from the dairy. And it had beautiful cheeses and local fruit and vegetables and meats. It's a market for people who cook. Mm -hmm. as opposed to people who graze and want to buy prepared foods. And that really struck me that it's geared toward cooking because it said a lot about Cleveland to me, that there are people who actually are creative rather than just acquiring. And that the art museum is fantastic. And the reason, the main reason I went is there was an exhibition of drawings by Michelangelo that only Cleveland had, and then they went to the Getty in Los Angeles, but the pandemic meant that no one could see it in LA. So I'm very glad I saw it in Cleveland. I did a lecture 
online about that Michelangelo exhibition for the Getty, but I never got to see it in Los Angeles. So it was an occasion to go to this wonderful museum in Cleveland. Mm. And so it's a deeply arts oriented cultured city. And I say that because it's not necessarily the impression people who don't study it have. Um, the Cleveland Orchestra was directed for many years by George Zell. The conductor, James Levine, who was from Cincinnati, was a protege in Cleveland. And, and many people who have had fantastic musical careers did part of their formation in Cleveland. Yeah. So I say that because that's where you grew up. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> yeah, that's all true. Um, you know, in fact, I grew up during the Zell era, and uh, that was quite a, a model to have as a kid. I mean, they don't make them any any better than that, basically. Talk and, about him. What was he like? Uh, he was a, a fantastic musician you know, had an incredible knowledge of the repertoire, an amazing memory, um, very difficult person. He was uh, really kind of a taskmaster, um, a disciplinarian, um, not an explosive person like uh, Toscanini or Kusevitsky, um, who then off the podium could be very congenial and, and pleasant. <laughs> so mm -hmm. was very authoritarian and uh, and could be difficult, although with kids, uh, mm -hmm. as, as I was at the time, he, he could be very uh, kind and uh, patient, answering questions and so on. So um, that was one aspect of it. But you mentioned the, the Metropolitan Tour, which used to come to Cleveland every year. Unfortunately, in Cleveland, they performed in the public auditorium, which had 12,000 seats. <laughs> and, you know, the two times that I managed to go to performances there, I might as well have been, you know, three blocks away. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a, not a positive experience. Uh, to, to go to one of those unless you were a patron who managed to sit in the first 20 rows, you know, that sort of thing. So I think that's one of the reasons why opera came later in my uh, uh, professional <laughs> or artistic uh, growth. But yeah, Cleveland, uh, I attended I took piano and theory lessons after school at the Cleveland Institute of Music. And, um, you know, it does have uh, and has had for many, many years a very, very uh, well-established uh, musical and cultural life. So now we're done being the Chamber of Commerce for Cleveland. Right. But it is important to point out because people know if they listen to these broadcasts that I grew up in New York City and you came to know Zell when you were a boy and I came to know Leonard Bernstein. And these people impact us for our whole lives. Absolutely. And I know so very often that the things that I teach or talk about or the way that I listen to music came from Lenny, as we were all allowed to call him and not just me. So there are only two first names I have, Lenny and Hector are the only two. <laughs> um, but I say this because how nowadays can we increase this connection? Because I loved your book, as you know, it's what in American English we call catnip, namely something that makes a cat become almost delirious with aphrodisia from everything that he takes in because I love reading about music from smart, interesting people. <clears throat> but you, you said that your family was not musical and, but you found your way to it. You were also in the book in the Sibelius chapter writing about the musical literacy of the Finns and how that enables I think people in Finland to be highly receptive to music. They don't have to be musicians, no. but it's a different kind of education. I actually taught for a week in a Finnish public school with very small kids. 
And they all were fantastically musical literate. And this was just a regular public school. It's not a specialized school for the arts. And, you know, it's something that we chew on all the time about how to get people more into music and all the arts. What are we doing right and what are we doing wrong? Well, I think you've hit the nail on the head. I mean, it has to start early. You have to, you know, give kids. I mean, even though, as I say, my family wasn't musical, I had a teacher in elementary school who noticed my sort of ability to pick up songs and whatnot. And she told my parents, you sh you've got to give him piano lessons. Good. And so I started when I was eight. Um, but also at that time, I don't. I hope this is still true in Cleveland and in many other cities. Uh, there were children's concerts given by the Cleveland Orchestra. They would do two weeks of children's concerts each semester, and so in the course of a year, I think when we were in fourth, fifth, and sixth grades, we were taken to a one hour, hour and fifteen minute concert that had a focus and that. Uh, at that time, Louis Lane was the assistant conductor of the orchestra. He conducted the concerts. Later on, uh, when I was already grown up, it was Jimmy Levine who did the children's concerts when he was Sell's assistant in Cleveland. And we, you know, got to hear, uh, got an introduction to it. Now, of course, there were those kids who threw spitballs at the conductor, mm -hmm. and there were others who fell asleep. And there were a few of us who really got hooked at that point. And that's all it takes, really, is something that, that strikes a, a chord, to use a musical mm -hmm. analogy, in you uh, to perhaps get you started. And to make, not, again, as you say, it's not that everybody's going to be a musician. We have a lot of unemployed musicians mm -hmm. already. What What there should be is a large body of people whose lives are enriched by this fantastic wealth uh, of, of uh, musical literature that we have. The same thing as with, you know, the visual arts and literature itself and, and so on and so forth. And so, you know, this is, I think, extremely important. If it doesn't start early on, it's probably it, it, not that it can't happen later as well, but it's harder. The older you are, the harder it is. You know, it's as if I were to start becoming interested uh, now in, or even when I was in my 30s or 40s in some nuclear physics. I don't know, whatever. Right. You know, it's much you harder. Have to put in the so called 10,000 hours when you're very young. Yeah. Do you think that? reading music should be a required part of instruction in schools and at what that, age? Yes, I think that basic, uh, you mentioned Richard Strauss, you know, he wrote a treatise, not a treatise, but he wrote a, about um, musical instruction and how uh, people, you know, of course, he was very arrogant about this. He said, you know, that people uh, think they say they're music lovers when they can't even um, uh, analyze a Bach fugue or uh, that sort of thing. You know, well, I disagree with that, but yeah. I understand that basically the deeper your understanding of something is, the more you can enjoy it. Also, <laughs> the opposite happens as well. The more yes. critical you become. Yeah. But nevertheless, you know, it's like anything else. If you if you become deeply involved in something, the level of participation grows. And, uh, you know, there are, of course, people who listen to music as a kind of background to whatever else they're doing. <clears throat> and, you know, I don't, I have no moral objection to that. Mm -hmm. But uh, when you really become... Uh, musically literate and can understand what's going on, even if your musical literacy is base, very basic, 
um, I think it, it's, it can be much more enriching. You know, if you sing in a choir when you're at school or whatever, even if you only learn to read a single musical line, um, the more you know, the, the, the better it is as far as um, gaining an appreciation and a love for uh, music as for anything else. I think also that very small kids are not for the most part resistant to learning things, whatever the things are. They absorb and, and they put it wherever they put it in different ways. So when I was in kindergarten, which is 60 years ago, um, teachers in the New York City public school system who taught kindergarten were required to know how to play the piano. And each kindergarten classroom had a pian an upright piano. And we would sit around and Miss Nafi was my teacher's name. And we absorbed this music she played. And the first two composers whose music I learned from Miss Nafi were Poulenc and Brahms. <laughs> now, Amazing. to think that Miss Nafi was playing a living composer at that time, he didn't live much longer, but Poulenc was alive when she was playing his music is astonishing to me now when I think about it. And how Miss Nafi chose Poulenc to play for us, I don't know. But it was at that level, and I'm talking about a public school for lower middle class kids. We are not rich in any way, but it was available to us and we learned and there were music programs. And then I had the good fortune when I was six or seven to fall into Leonard Bernstein's circle and attend, be part of his focus group for his young persons concerts. And we, he would turn to us, he was a great teacher. And again, we get back to Brahms, that he was doing the Brahms Second Symphony and basically tried out vocabulary on us to see what we understood and what clicked and what didn't. And he, this was a rehearsal. But then when he did his live concerts, he would incorporate what we responded to well and leave out what we didn't respond to, mm -hmm. which is what a good teacher does. Yeah so that he was able to connect on live television across the nation. Unthinkable now that we would have a conductor teaching the nation music, but that's what we had then. And I'm not lamenting the past, but I really want that people today have the same benefits of musical literacy and engagement without it feeling like a test. Right. Yeah. And, you know, uh, similarly, I remember when I was working on this last uh, Toscanini biography that came out four years ago, um, I read a Time magazine article, 1934, when he was conducting the New York Philharmonic, uh, and I believe it was nine million people listened to the Philharmonic Sunday afternoon broadcasts in the United States, which at that time was 7% of the entire population yeah. of the country. Yeah. And, uh, you know, of course, the, uh, what was there? There were three radio networks and, and um, you know, there were movies, of course, but as far as in the home, was concerned if you wanted to turn on the radio and listen to something there were three possibilities and that was one of them on Sunday afternoons or whenever yeah I think the, the mm -hmm. for Sunday afternoons and From so Carnegie Hall but this brings exactly. up another thing then nowadays we have all kinds of other ways to access musical performances in our case here I Dajo, and I went into the catalog and I put nine of the 10 works that you proposed in your book. And I made selections almost always drawn from one of your favorites, to my knowledge, also based on what was available in Adagio. But I mention this because when people access streaming, it's not the same as the radio for the simple reason that on the radio, if you turn it on, if the New York Philharmonic is playing the Beethoven seventh and the Sibelius second, that's what you get to hear. Whereas with streaming, 
you can hear anything available in the catalog. And Adagio has million, like a million works the last time I checked. And so therefore it's really, or performances, it's really endless. How do you guide, yes, your book is a wonderful way to do it, but how do you guide a listener to what we call nowadays curation? I know Adagio does that saying, if you're in this mood or if you're interested in uh, Prokofiev, you may want to hear Shostakovich, that kind of thing. But how would you guide a listener to pick mm -hmm. from streaming? rather than just saying, play whatever you feel like? Interesting question. I mean, <clears throat> you know, I'm uh, even older than you uh, by 10 years, I guess. <laughs> and um, so I not, uh, I do use, you know, YouTube and so on and so forth for, especially when I'm doing research on, on for a new book or whatever, or I just suddenly feel like, you know, I wonder if there's a performance available of such and such a work with this performer whom I'm interested in for whatever reason at that time. How I would guide somebody else, I don't know. I think I would have to, you know, know that person to, to sort of um, have an idea of what that person might be interested in. You know, when I was a kid and starting to listen very seriously to music, um, I would try to convert <laughs> some of my friends. And I remember, you know, sometimes uh, in summer they would say, you know, they'd knock on the door, can you come out and play baseball with us? And I'd say, I'll play baseball with you if afterwards you come up to my room and we listen to you know the Tchaikovsky 1812 overture or some mm -hmm. other exciting piece and some of them would say yes and some would most would say no but yeah. you know it worked in a couple of cases one of my best friends who had no interest in music at all before suddenly developed an interest in you know wanted to hear the Beethoven violin concerto and that sort of thing so I know how to do that on a one-to-one -one basis. I'm not sure, even though I teach, uh, uh, in my case, I teach people who are already musicians or about to become professional musicians when I teach at the Curtis Institute of Music. So um, I love talking to people about music who are people who are not musicians, but um, how to guide people I'm not talking to directly, I, I don't know, actually. So we're going to try I'll an experiment. to read my books. <laughs> we're going to try an experiment. I'm going to tell you a brief story, and then I'm going to ask you to use me as the person that you have to guide in a certain direction. And here's the story. When I wrote Classical Music 101, uh, I'd written Opera 101, and I chose 11 operas. It's kind of like this book in that they're not the 11 best operas. But by the end of the 11, which go from Mozart to Strauss, I would have taught everything that I would want my reader and listener to know to be able to go to any opera from Monteverdi up to John Adams and beyond. And, but for my Classical Music 101 book, I, there were many more things to cover. And I sort of felt rather than it only being in my voice, let me go talk to the great musicians about individual works. So I had Crystal Ludwig on Mahler and I had Gergiev on conducting and I had Marilyn Horn on Brahms actually. And um, the last person I was able to get to finally talk to me because he was always busy was James Levine on Mozart's 40th Symphony. And it's not that he necessarily is the one to talk to about that, but I was missing Mozart in the mouth of an expert. And I just decided I want him to talk. He could speak about anything and he was brilliant. And, but after we finished the conversation, which I recorded, he said to me, okay, Fred, I have a question for you now. Which composer did you really not quite get or feel when you began working on this book that now is indispensable? And I said, that's easy, Schubert. And he said, that's right. Schubert, as you were saying, is not the most accessible, but he's also quite magnificent now that I've come to learn him. And then he said, 
And what composer among the greats that you did you begin the book with and not have a great feeling for that you still don't feel? And I said, with exceptions in some of his works, which I love, Brahms. And he said, that's not good. <laughs> and I said, I'm going to keep working on it. I think he expected me to say something like Debussy or someone a little more satiric. Mm. But yes, there are works by Brahms, especially the German Requiem, that I think are just sublime. And I love them. Um, but others of Brahms, it's not that I reject them. They just don't deeply move him, move me. And I know he's a very emotional composer and there are people who just flip out over the emotions and the, the lush romanticism and so on. And I, I think my answer to that is from my view is that what we have in each case is the meeting of the person doing the hearing and the listening with the music and also the interpreters who do it. Now, I know that I've heard many great Brahms performances. Bernstein, as I mentioned early on, Miss Nafi, he was the second composer after Poulenc. From the very beginning, Brahms is part of my life. My father played him constantly, loved Brahms. What can you say to me, and you know me, so this is easier for you than if you didn't know me, to unlock Brahms for me and let me in, apart from things like the German Requiem and certain songs. Hmm. Um, and the violin concerto. Yeah. I don't know because Brahms came early for me and has stayed there. And in fact, I remember, you know, I was doing a book with James Levine many years ago that then we never finished. But I remember uh, talking with him about Brahms and we both had the same experience uh, when we were in our teens of people saying to us, oh, Brahms is a composer for adolescence. And you know, later on, you won't like him as well. And both of us had the exact opposite experience of, of loving his music even more as we uh, matured and, and grew older. So I don't know what I would say. I mean, in my so I'm case, not old enough for Brahms. <laughs> <laughs> Keep trying. Um, no, you know, I remember in my teens, what I loved initially, I think were maybe the first symphony, you know, with its high drama right from the very beginning. Um, I remember having a recording of that quite early on that I listened to a lot. Um, then oddly enough, um, one day this friend who played in the Cleveland Orchestra said to me, I must have been 15 or 16. He said, you know, this incredible German singer just came and performed with the orchestra. Uh, the uh, Mahler, I think it was the Lieder eines Freunden Gesellen. And uh, his voice is just unbelievable and a wonderful musician. And it was Dietrich Fischer Dieskau. And I went out and bought a recording of Brahms' Lieder with Fischer Dieskau. And that really bowled me over completely. Um, some, of the, some of the songs more than others, of course. I'm laughing because I knew him as a kid when I was a kid. And we ne thank goodness I never said, ugh, Brahms. <laughs> <laughs> Would have ended right. our friendship. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and so... Whereas yeah. his Hugo Wolf for me, and, you know, Hugo Wolf is not for children necessarily, completely blew me away. Mm -hmm. And his Mahler, I appreciated. I had to grow up to really appreciate his Mahler a lot more. But uh, he sang certain Beethoven lead that were very beautiful Absolutely. i mean he was a mar marvelous singer but somehow we never set foot on brahms together which is probably a good mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. yeah. uh, i mean i will it'll, was... it'll forever echo in my ears from 20 years ago when james levine said to me that's not good <laughs> <laughs> i can hear him saying <laughs> 
But I, I say this because it's not that I don't have the Brahms gene the way my friend Stephen claims not to have the Mozart gene. But music is so visceral, so personal, so emotional that I don't think there's much right and wrong. I just no. think that we all connect mm. differently. I mean, Berlioz and Rossini particularly make me ecstatic mm -hmm. on repeated hearing and I never get tired and I hear new things. And Harvey, this is an important thing to talk about for listening. Um, Many people, when they hear music that they like again, they are reminded of what they liked. And I try to teach people to listen for something new, whether it's the same performance by the same musicians or whether suddenly it's a different conductor and different singer, a different pianist. Listen for something new rather than hear to be reminded of what you liked. How do you teach listening to people? I don't know. I know that um, I know, you know, again, because it, for me, it started so early, it became sort of automatic and uh, kind of hard to describe. But I remember uh, many years ago talking to um, Robert Bloom, who was the principal oboe of the NBC Symphony during its early years, and he was very young at the time was one of my many interviews with Toscanini's musicians. And he told me this story about going to see Toscanini at his home in Riverdale. Um, at one point, there was some personnel problem in the orchestra that had to be discussed or something like that. And he said he went there in the morning. He had an appointment to see him in the morning. And he saw him looking very tired. And he said, Maestro, what's the matter? You know, you look tired, uh, something wrong. And Toscanini said, no, I was up all night studying the symphony that we're doing next week. Well, the symphony that they were doing the following week was the Beethoven Fifth, which Toscanini had conducted, you know, hundreds of times. And uh, Bloom said, but Maestro, you know, you and of course, Toscanini had a photographic memory in addition to everything else. Bloom said, you know, Maestro, you, you know this symphony so well. And Toscanini said, yes, but there's always something I know I've missed. Yeah. And this was, you know, an extraordinarily uh, well-prepared, to put it mildly, professional yeah. musician. So for the rest of us, whether we're musically trained or not, the number of things that you can hear, even in a recorded performance if you listen over and over again to it let alone in multiple performances of the same work is just almost infinite as, as close to infinity as 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 the finite can come i would say which so. then leads me to a bigger topic because it's bigger is opera where People say to me, oh, I've seen La Traviata. I've seen Tosca. You named the opera. I don't have to see it again. It's right. kind of like a checklist. <laughs> Whereas when I tell people that I've heard easily 150 performances of Rigoletto, easily, and that that's not the exception, that you know I've heard hundreds of Toscas and all the standard rep, and I've been to probably 60 Gottedamerungs. So, and that takes time. Yeah, <laughs> and, live, and live to tell the story, right? Oh, I love oh. <laughs> All right, I'm going to have to share a, a pun that I came up with yesterday. A dear friend of mine from London, my former publisher when, when she was active in the book business, came to New York to see family, and I saw her yesterday, and it was the first British friend I've seen in two years. And she was telling me that she's going up to Vermont for the weekend to see a former publisher here, who has retired and now raises goats and makes goat's milk and goat's cheese and so on that wins all kinds of awards. And my friend said, um, well, sadly, about three years ago, there was some disease that went around and all the goats had to be put down. They had to be killed because they had this disease. I she know said, where this is going. She said, <laughs> What would you, what do you think of that? I said, it sounds like go to Dabarone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
you're excused. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was great. <laughs> but <laughs> but the, with opera, where there are so many pieces in one opera, we're, we'll talk about Don Carlo in a minute, but um, let's take an opera that's smaller in scale, like Così Fan Tutte, that has six characters, a small chorus, um, even that has endless pieces of elements to make it work. But if you have a huge opera like Don Carlo with massive choruses and big orchestras and many cast members and, and uh, a group that shows up six baritones to sing for four minutes in the auto da fe, <laughs> Verdi put everything in that. Um, how can we give people the sense that these are masterpieces that merit continued exploration and not just a checklist of I've seen Don Carlo, I don't have to see it again. Yeah, well, obviously there are people who are inclined to, you know, you hear something that grabs your attention and you want to hear it again. And there are other people who are just casual listeners. And I always think one of the first times probably the first time I was in Europe when I was in my mid twenties, I went to the uh, Louvre in Paris and Le Jeu de Paume, which is where the Impressionist collection used to be. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting down at one point, just, you know, astonished and exhausted and uh, trying to gather strength to go on <laughs> and sitting down and I ha didn't realize that I was between two American women who were visiting together with their family. And one of them talking across me said to the other, well, where are you know Jim and Jane or whatever? And the other one said, well, they're looking at the paintings in the other room. And the first woman said, well, what are they doing? Looking at them one at a time? <laughs> <laughs> You know, so that gives me the same feeling as, oh, I've heard that opera, you know. I mean, you can't possibly, you know, even if you're a musical genius, you can't encompass what's going on in an entire opera at a single hearing, let alone if you're a casual listener. Now, of course, there are people who, let's face it, the opera companies also need casual listeners to buy tickets and come and hear whatever it is once and then come and hear another opera the next time. But if you really want to, like anything else, if you want to get to know a piece of poetry or a painting or whatever it is, you have to focus on it. And uh, one I guess what I'm driving at is that in our modern times where there are so many <clears throat> technological and other distractions as opposed to enhancements. Something like Adagio to me is a wonderful thing because it means I can access things I didn't have access to before. But there are people who will pick up their iPhone and just punch on it for an hour and who knows what they get at the end of the hour. Um, I try to teach not just for the arts, but in general, active engagement. Uh, the use of the senses to always be open to something rather than trying to fulfill a pre-digested experience. So if someone says to me, oh, you have to see the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Well, yeah, but also I need to try to understand why it's leaning and, and what the story is and Galileo and everything that comes behind it. Um, I remember vividly the first time I went to Madrid, which was for me relatively late in my traveling experience. I was in my early 40s and I went to the Prado on an extremely rainy afternoon in Madrid, which meant that you couldn't go out around in Madrid. And I knew that I wanted to see the Goyas and the Titians and the Velazquez's. And I turned a corner and there was a painting by an artist who then I had not yet heard of, Roger van der Weyden, the deposition from the cross. And it was kind of like I was knocked dead. And I found a chair and I sat down and I looked at this painting for at least two hours because it was raining out anyway, so I didn't have to, couldn't go anywhere. But 
I vowed to go back to the Prado the next day to see the Goyas and other things. I just had to take this thing in. And what I recount that for is that if we are open to new experience without premeditation, we get such pleasure and enrichment and, and depth that we didn't expect because I never heard of Roger van der Weyden. Mm -hmm. And the story of the deposition of the cross, I'm not a Christian. I knew it kind of, but I didn't know the drama of it. And I didn't know every, this was like watching a dramatic opera, like listening to a huge symphony, like um, reading an intense novel, all in visual arts. And I, I love visual arts. That's not my strength, but I love them anyway. But minor musical and, and perhaps theatrical. And I, I guess, you know, number one, I want to say about your book that it hits the perfect sweet spot for people who may not know much about music and for people such as myself who know something about music but always wants to know more. And you, I don't know how you achieve this. You are a great writer and teacher, but you simultaneously spoke to the newcomer without distancing that person, but also spoke to the musicologically inclined and to the cynics. And not that I'm a cynic, but I could hear you providing correctives there for certain things that you were anticipating. And I mean, that's why I read Harvey Sachs and read him before I met him. And why I encourage other people to do it. So I'm not doing a commercial here, but 10 Masterpieces of Music is a really a wonderful book. Um, getting back, who shall I pick? We're not going to go to Hector yet. Let's go to Giuseppe Verdi, Don Carlo, which happens to be, if I had to be pressed to say it, my favorite opera. Hmm. And I who work in opera don't want to have to declare my favorite because I would quickly add 10 more. I typically name five or six and then say an every note written by Rossini. <laughs> Not because the stories are always the most compelling, but it's just the Rossini gene. But why Don Carlo in the context of this? Because it's certainly a big piece to chew and not necessarily one that a reader just coming to this art form would be inclined to immediately go to. Mm -hmm. Well, I, as I noted in my, first of all, thank you very much for your kind words about my work, which I appreciate coming from you. Um, I think that, uh, as I said in the preface to the book, um, I didn't want to choose, you know, the, the Mozart's greatest hit and this one's greatest hit. So I didn't do Eine kleine Nachtmusik and I didn't do the Ninth Symphony and so on. And with Verdi, I didn't want to do the big three middle operas, you know, Rigoletto, Trovatore, Traviata. I didn't want to do Otello. But you uh, knew also, it would be Verdi. I knew that my opera composer would be, it would, okay. would have, either I had, would have done a Mozart opera and but what then with Verdi, if not an opera, I could have done the Requiem, I suppose, but I wanted to do Verdi. And so naturally opera <clears throat> was the, the category. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, Mozart and Verdi are my two favorite, absolute favorite opera composers. And um, so, yeah, uh, Don Carlo is an opera that I, love tremendously. I first got to know it, not by live performance, but through the uh, old Giulini recording with, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Caballé and Domingo, <clears throat> Cheryl Milnes and so on. Um, Yaurov, I think, was in that as well. Yep. Um, you know, it's, it's such a great dramatic canvas and it offers so much and it also... Um, I think Verdi had very personal feelings, especially about uh, <laughs> with his anti-organized religion, mm -hmm. uh, 
feelings and uh, um, his uh, sense of the uh, possibility of monarchs to be oppressors, et cetera, et cetera. I think there was a, so much in it that was personal to him, as well as, uh, you know, a fascinating plot that he figured correctly that he could set very well. So all of those... Which is based to some degree on truth, but filtered through a play by Schiller. Right. Uh, yeah. There's very little historical truth in the in the plot, as I pointed out in there. If you go back and look at who, I mean, first of all, Don Kylo himself, there's nothing to do basically with, with what happens in the plot. There was no romantic, let alone sexual relationship between Don Carlo and Elisabetta. And there's no, you know. And there was no the, Rodrigo. There was no Rodrigo. He didn't exist. The whole, the whole Eboli story is completely, complete nonsense. I mean, she existed, uh, but the, that story didn't exist. This was all, it, it was stuff that was piled on first about 50 or 100 years after the events, and then the story grew and grew, and then Schiller took it and uh, legitimately, completely legitimately trans translated it into something else. And Verdi based his story on that plus other sources. So uh, I don't know if you, you probably did notice uh, at the, <clears throat> excuse me, at the end, I mentioned that um, Victor Emmanuel II, who became the first king of United Italy, was actually a descendant of, uh, of uh, Philip II, uh, Charles V, the emperor, and, um, and uh, what you call it, Elizabeth, uh, you know, Elizabeth de Valois, who was right. Philip's wife. He was. And do you know Victor who Elizabeth Emmanuel de Valois' mother was? Uh, yeah, Catherine de' Medici. Isn't that was, amazing? Uh, right. Uh, <laughs> she was uh, Italian. <laughs> right, and the, and the massacre of the Huguenots and so on and so forth. <laughs> terrible. They were all pretty terrible, in fact. Yeah. But um, so, yeah, the, the, the drama is fantastic. The delineation of character is amazing. And I've always had a particular love of that uh, garden scene between... Uh, Don Carlo and Elizabeth, where uh, he enters supposedly calmly to, you know, to ask her to help him get permission to go to Flanders. And then it turns into this uh, incredible crisis between the two of them with her at the end shouting to him, you know, telling him how, you know, what do you expect to do? You're going to go and kill your father and marry your stepmother and mm -hmm. he runs out and but this is i i always say this is an eight minute long tristan on his old story well and, it's uh, interesting because um my favorite verity character of all verity is elizabeth and don carlo wonderful yeah. and i refer to her aria wonderful aria at the end to che le vanita conoscesti del mondo as the italian libas taught so I never heard anyone else refer to this as Tristan and he's older, but that's mm -hmm. always how I've seen it. Um, it's a great role and it's not the showiest role. No, no. It's at not. all. I mean, Eboli is very showy. The king in his way is very showy. Carlo is very neurotic and interesting and Posa is noble and romantic. And Elizabeth sometimes can get lost in there unless you have Montserrat Caballier or Morella Franey or someone like that doing the role and then you understand that Verdi put Elizabeth for last because to me the opera is called Don Carlo but it's about her yes it's it about her journey not his journey yeah it revolves around her and it revolves around Philip yeah uh, much more than around Don Carlo himself but um yeah, that about the, the Italian Isolde reminds me, you know, Maestro Gavazzini, Gian Andrea Gavazzini, Italian conductor and a brilliant man, used to say uh, that Il Trovatore was the Italian St. Matthew Passion. <laughs> wow, why? <laughs> which, which is uh, <laughs> a weird 
uh, a weird combination or weird analogy, but I understand what he's saying. The St. Matthew Passion is this intense religious northern Protestant, um, uh, you know, uh, masterpiece, obviously, whereas Il Trovatore is a different kind of passion altogether. It's passion in the other sense. And uh, and it's four completely cuckoo characters who r rush to each other's destruction one way or the other. Wow. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it was, a, I think he said that partly in jest, but there is, there is something behind the, the statement. Well, you know, as we've both revealed today and everyone else knows, relationships to music and stories and operas are deeply personal and not to be gainsaid. But my least favorite of the big Verdi operas happens to be Il Trovatore. Mm. And I recognize entirely that the music is magnificent. And for many people, it's the best musical opera of Verdi. I don't, I don't claim best for music, but it's great music and I happily listen to it. But there's nothing in the story that engages me emotionally. And it's the exception in all Verdi operas where all the others I do engage. Um, and I, in studying this opera, because I study it a lot more than I do most of the others to try to get into it the way I study Brahms for the same reason. Mm -hmm. And the thing about Trovatore is until Falstaff, it was the only opera that Verdi did without a commission. He was taken by the story and by the characters and by the tinto, as he called it, the sort of color tone of the opera, the story. And it was premiered in Rome in 1852, and the librettist had died before, and it had issues. But I always wonder, what was it that Verdi was so drawn to that he would work on this without a commission? He was a businessman. His previous opera was Rigoletto. He could have done anything for a big fee. Traviata came after. But this is what he went for. And I don't know how you feel about the opera Trovatore as an opera. But what is it that makes it great, apart from the brilliant music? Yeah, um, I think, you know, again, well, you know, of course, Caruso's famous statement that Il Trovatore is an, supposedly his statement that uh, Trovatore is an easy opera to perform. All you need are the four greatest singers right. in the world. Um, it's very much a singer's opera. <laughs> and, you know, if you have great singers who are convincing as these cuckoo characters that they're representing, um, you know, the intensity is amazing. I mean, think of how um, Caballé, for instance, um, did the part of Leonora in, in Trovatore. The, that first aria, you know, the second scene of the, of the opera, um, this intensity, the, the glow, the um, and uh, in a way the absurdity. I mean, she's fallen in love with somebody. She happened to, you know, put the crown on his head, laurel leaf or whatever it was on his head, when he won the the joust at the, you know, uh, and and she's waiting for him, and and this is her entire life, and she will give up her life if necessary for this man, and likewise. He has the same point of view, and and the count again. He's madly in love with her, and so he's going to kill. And Azucena, who <laughs> I don't know whether you knew the Italian pianist Mario Deli Ponti in Milan, he was a great opera lover, and he said to me, "You know, one of these days I'm going to go to one of those." coaches at uh, La Scala who know every note of every opera, and I'm going to say, hey, is Azucena a good guy or a bad guy? <laughs> because when you get to the end of the opera, you're not quite sure. So, um, you know, it is, it's a, it's a nutty plot in many ways, but 
each character beyond the because there are a lot of preposterous plots in opera many yes. Rossini's but I don't for these characters I don't feel anything and that may just be me but I think that Dolores Ajek who's one of the great Azucenas once explained the opera to me from her point of view and it made perfect sense. It was post-traumatic stress disorder <laughs> and she was reliving what happened to her mother and the yep. wrong baby thrown in the fire and all this stuff. But the way Delora explained it, actually it did make a lot of sense. And I felt, well, I'm sorry for her, but <laughs> didn't quite. It's nothing like Elizabeth and Don Carlo or Gilda or any Violetta, obviously. There's Damon, all of these characters, even in the comedy and Alice Ford, mm. you feel something for this a humanity there. And Verdi was the most humane, perhaps with Mozart of all the composers. And, and yet in this opera, only that opera that he worked on without commission, something must have grabbed him. Mm. And so that's what I'm, when I study Trovatore, that's what I try to understand by looking at the music and the words and the history. And so I'm going to transition a bit because there's something else I'm going to say to you now as a friend, and I think you'll understand what I'm saying. I had a very unexpected reaction while reading your book. Um. I was filled with sadness and I haven't had that <laughs> for a long time, certainly not reading musicology. And I really was trying to understand why. And I listened to all the music that you recommend, the 10 pieces. And I think because almost all of these guys had terrible lives. Mm -hmm. And I think reading back to back to back to back to back, Verdi, I wouldn't say had a terrible life, but he had a very hard life with a lot of adversity and the death of his wife and his two children and all kinds of things that are a test. Uh, Sibelius, I don't know if he had a hard life per se, but he did a lot of it to himself with his drinking and his smoking and so on. Uh, and he was just sort of a tough character. But all the others, really, and I think it was just, it was kind of like a, a pile up. It was like watching King Lear, where suddenly in the space of about 10 minutes, everyone dies. <laughs> and <laughs> and I, I'm certainly not saying this is a criticism, not at all. But, you know, Schubert, syphilis, Beethoven, deafness, Mozart, premature death, Schumann, syphilis, all continental disease, Berlioz, not being understood at all being completely despised practically by the establishment. Uh, Verdi, his adversity. Prokofiev, in some ways, an okay life, but actually, to me, a life full of awful choices mm -hmm. that he made, and I, they're inexplicable to me. And Stravinsky, a problematic figure, let's say that. And, you know, Brahms, too, had some glory in his life, but reading about, you know, the poverty and playing uh, piano in brothels in Hamburg. Which probably wasn't true. Actually. Probably wasn't true. But, you know, a lot of these guys, let's be blunt, had syphilis, which was a 19th century disease that cut its way through. Um, I study a lot the 15th and 16th centuries in Italy, and... I happen to know about syphilis that it was not diagnosed as a sexually transmitted disease until 1525 in Verona, very specifically by a pharmacist in Verona, which means that when we talk about STDs before, um, they're thought to have arrived on the Italian peninsula in 1494 uh, via Spain, whatever. Everyone blames everyone else, the French disease, the Spanish disease, it seems to have arrived in Naples or somewhere in Italy in 1494, which meant that from 1494 to 1525, people didn't know it was sexually transmitted. Imagine AIDS in our time that we wouldn't know for almost 30 years that it's sexually transmitted and anyone could just get it. And But by the 19th century, they knew 
And yet they all, not all, but a lot of them got it. Mm. And it made me wonder about their behaviors, not in a negative way, but just wondering, was it something in their questing romantic spirit, their obtuseness to reality because they were so focused on their creative genius, um, bad luck. But Schumann especially, and the piece you picked is the wonderful Dieter Liebe, and I included the Dietrich Fischer Dieskau performance based on poems of Heinrich Heine, 20 songs. And it's gorgeous stuff. And the way that he'd be able through his disease and his afflictions and his depressions to access that genius was pretty remarkable. But it made me very sad. <laughs> very, I've not read a book of musicology ever that made me so sad. And, and you know, I'm not asking for you to analyze me. You can if you wish. <laughs> but were you aware in the writing of this book that it was really an accumulation of a lot of terrible personal stories of these people? I mean, uh, can you name a composer of whom... <laughs> a great composer who does not have a lot of sadness. Um, Frank Copeland? Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> More modern, modern, modern. modern. Um, uh, it, you know, I mean, unfortunately... Did Richard Strauss have a lot of sadness? Uh, probably not. No. Probably not. Um, but, you know, part of... But what, I get your point. Part of what deepens people is also, I mean, we all go through some form of loss and, you know, anyone who lives beyond the age of <clears throat> 10 or 15, you know, you, you go through loss, disappointments, uh, errors, sometimes very costly errors, um, all sorts of things. And so there is sadness in every uh, in every life. And uh, I think that creative people have these special antennae that pick up the sad, the, the intense, the uh, erotic, mm -hmm. um, all of the things. That's that... my friend Wagner, by the way. <laughs> yes, yes. And uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, they all have have things like that that run through their lives. Uh, and so, no, I certainly wasn't, I didn't uh, pick the composers on the basis oh, of I know. sadness. And, and I would say, you know, yes, Stravinsky had a daughter and his first wife who died of tuberculosis, which was extremely common in the and up to, you know, the mid 20th century. Um, Prokofiev, as you say, made some very bad <laughs> decisions. Many bad choices. Yeah. Um, but uh, would you talk about a few of Prokofiev's bad choices? I, to me, it's I almost want to say, Sergei, you brought it on yourself. Well, yeah. Um, again, though. In my opinion, his deepest music was written after he made those terrible choices. Mm -hmm. um, not that he wasn't just as gifted before he went back to Stalin's Soviet Union, but uh, I think that a lot of the music tended to be a little more superficial beforehand. The, the, the piece, certainly the piece that I write about, the Eighth Sonata, and a piece like the Sixth Symphony, the, the F minor violin sonata, uh, the G minor violin concerto, I think that those exhibit a kind of uh, depth that he didn't have before, before he experienced this, because he was a, he was a child prodigy and a spoiled brat, unlike a lot of the child prodigies who grew up either being <laughs> beaten by their parents or you know, forced to uh, show off their talents or whatever. Prokofiev was, uh, and most of them grew up poor, 
Um, Prokofiev grew up in a well-off upper middle class family. He was treated like a child. Like, you know, he was the apple of his parents' eye. He was an only child and so on. He was kind of a brat. Um, but... Uh, well, you know, I read in your book, he had two sisters who died before him, I guess. Yeah. And did was he really um, coddled because he was so precious and they wanted to keep him alive because they had lost two girls before? Or was he happier as, quote, the only child because that's just that was just his nature? Hard to say, you know, I mean, child infant mortality was extremely common. And, yeah. Uh, All throughout you know, your book. <laughs> yeah. There we go. I mean, Mozart, you know, uh, of, of his parents, six children, he and his sister Nanerl were the only survivors. And he and Constanza had six children, of whom there were two, two boys. Yeah. And, you know, that I mean, when you read that after the first one was born, a couple of weeks later, they go off, leaving the child behind, they go off to visit his father and sister in Salzburg. They leave yeah. Vienna. And they go off for whatever it was, a month or six weeks or something, leaving the kid with a, a wet nurse. Yep. Uh, you know, they didn't expect, I think maybe they didn't invest in, in emotionally invest in children, in infants, as much as, yeah. as we do now. Which actually and brings me to a other... question that I think about a little, but I've never really yeah. asked someone in great detail. Um, a vein throughout your book that I much appreciated among the many um, was your addressing of the religiosity of some of these figures. And, and I want the readers to go to the book and find that out for themselves. But the first one was Mozart. And I always wonder about him because he, I think he was religious. And when you read his language and his letters, um, there are invocations of God and Yezu and Mary and the whole crowd. But um, was he sort of a cosmopolitan Catholic? What do you think of him on that? Because he wrote incredibly powerful religious music. He wrote uh, glorious stuff such as the Exultate Jubilate. But in his operas, and he loved being an opera composer, I wouldn't say that these are people living by traditional... <laughs> values as taught by the church no where do you find him in terms of religion also the, frankly faith the fact that four of his six children would die things like that very hard to say in his case i mean i always have the feeling in reading his letters when he's writing to his father he lays on the religious uh qualities much thicker than he does when he's writing to anybody else, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of uh, in, in letters to others. There are sexual allusions and and all sorts of other stuff. When he's writing to his father, he's always on his best behavior, and I think he writes what he wants his father to hear. Um, and of course, he became a mason, which the church. Yeah disapproved of completely, even though the then emperor, Joseph II, uh, allowed it, even though he was the Holy Roman Emperor, as well as Emperor of Austria. Um, uh, he was, the emperor himself was very interested in the Masonic idea of human brotherhood, or at least among males, um, and, and so on. And Mozart was a devoted- Which for people who don't know, feeds the opera, The Magic Flute, Die Zabaflirte. Yeah. There's the whole subtext of Masonism and the fraternity and the brotherhood and wisdom yeah. and nature and so on and truth. Yes, also through Chicanada, the, the, yeah. the Bratis. And um, who sang Papageno. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And so <clears throat> it's very hard to tell. He was, a he was a very cosmopolitan person. I mean, here was somebody who, unlike... 99.999% of most people in those days had traveled incredibly Everywhere. widely. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> and he know, was traveling he, just with his mother when she died in Paris. That's right. That's right. And, you know, he had a friend in Paris. Her name was Marie Antoinette, and she was a Habsburg who became Marie <laughs> Antoinette. And they were born the same year, 1756. And 
Marie Antoinette was very helpful to him when his mother died. Hmm. I didn't. It was not I just let them eat cake, but it was she really, really came, stepped up for Mozart at that point oh. when it was necessary. Yeah, yeah. wonderful. Um, yeah. Yes. No, no. Go ahead. Okay. I want to, there are so many, you and I could stay here for 10 hours, one for each of the masterpieces. But there are two things that I want to read from your book, the brief sections, and then we'll get into a discussion of what they tell us. The first one is about Beethoven. For non-musicians, Beethoven's ability to compose music despite his advancing deafness is the most remarkable element in his biography. But the truth is, Deafness made a much worse impact on his personal life than on his musical career. Many well-trained musicians can hear a piece of music in their mind's ear simply by reading a score. And many composers write their music without trying it out on the piano or any other instrument. It is possible, maybe even likely, that his deafness was a major factor in leading him into previously unexplored regions of musical creativity, but composing despite being deaf was not in itself as extraordinary a feat as many non-musicians believe. Talk about that. Yeah, well, that's absolutely true. I mean, a well-trained, not all well-trained musicians, but many well-trained musicians, you know, you look at the score and you, you hear it in your head. And so um, that in itself was not all, I mean, Yes, the fact that he composed uh, music that was uh, harmonically advanced in a way that nobody else had done, especially in his late works, um, you know, that went into new new areas, um, you know, all of that is is truly remarkable for anybody, and especially for someone who was deaf and couldn't hear what he had written. On the other hand, that fact in itself is not the most astonishing fact about it. The fact that he had the ideas that he had, that's astonishing. Mm -hmm. But uh, as I said in the book, the, the impact of deafness on his social life and on his, his ability to relate to other people, which was already difficult. He was a thorny character from youth on. But, you know, then becoming deaf and this increasing isolation from, from people and the need from about the age of, from his mid-40s on to communicate, people would have to write in a notebook when they wanted to ask him something. Um, all of that was really devastating to him. Since we're talking about religion, let's talk about Beethoven and religion. He issued a, I don't know what we'd call it, a letter or a statement called the Heiligenstadt Testament when he realized that his encroaching deafness was really severe. Um, he was around the time, I believe, of the fourth piano concerto and Fidelio and so on. It was earlier. It was the fourth symphony. It was 1802. No, it right, was so the before, fourth symphony, not the fourth piano concerto. It was before all of that. It was before the Eroica even, it was before, uh -huh. uh, it was, I think he had by then written or was about to write the second symphony, but yeah, it, it was, he was still in what we, what musicologists call the early period. Right. The three and periods. he questioned everything, you know, God, why did you do this to me? Which you hear many opera characters say, uh, from Tosca to lots of Verdi characters and, and, German characters too. Um, but do you think he was religious? I used to see Fidelio as being sort of a progressive anti-establishment opera, but when I've studied it more, and especially the later scenes in the second act, it's all about God and, and fulfilling God's will and so on. Where do you where do you see him in that context? We spoke of Verdi being anti-clerical, Mozart being a cosmopolitan Catholic. Um, Berlioz, I think, was a doubter, although he wrote a magnificent Requiem and Deum. Um, but where do you see Beethoven in terms of religion? 
Um, well, Beethoven, I think, was a pantheist. Um, he believed in God, but not in, you know, uh, he believed God and nature were basically the same thing for him. God is everything. I think that was his point of view. On the other hand, <laughs> like a lot of uh, non-Orthodox believers, when things got bad, he would say, you know, why are you doing this to me? And so... By the uh, way, I left that Tevye and Fiddler on the Roof in the Sholem Aleichem stories, <laughs> talking right. directly to God. Right. <laughs> why me again? Right. right. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, and, and uh, that does come out, and uh, certainly in Fidelio, but of course you can't... Fidelio, I think the main point of why he chose that text was the idea of human freedom and you know liberation from tyranny whatever kind of tyranny whether it was political tyranny or or uh, psychological tyranny mm -hmm. um you know that 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 was uh so so very very important to him the uh, religious aspect um rejoicing uh, at the end and thanking God and so on. I mean, I think that came naturally. Uh, but no, he was not an Orthodox believer. As far as we know, apart from baptism and last rites, I don't know that he, uh, as an adult, ever really set foot in, in a church, except maybe for, you know, funerals and mm -hmm. uh, weddings or whatever. Um, I don't think he attended mass, uh, even though, you know, he grew up in a Catholic city and Vienna was a Catholic city as well, where he I spent like almost all of his adult life. So he was not religious in a conventional sense, but. And yet he could write the Mrs. Solemnis, which is a yeah, work that know, grows for me all the time. Look, look at all the great religious music that was written by either non-believers or or serious, uh, either agnostics or, or doubters. I mean, you know, Beethoven, Schubert. Schubert changed the words in some of the mass texts that he sent, which you, you can't do. You're not supposed to do that. Um, and my favorite Brahms piece, the German Requiem. All right, and Brahms absolutely was a non-believer. Yeah. He yeah. loved reading the Bible. It was his favorite book, but he was a non-believer and very emphatic about that. And also one of the few uh, major composers who was not an anti-Semite. Ian Verdi, yeah. Yeah, also. Um, or you know, Stravinsky, why was Stravinsky such an anti-Semite? I mean, Stravinsky up and down on that point, you know. Yeah. Uh, some, it was some of my best friends are Jewish, right. but, you know. Uh, was that inbred, um, some of the stuff he had, I'm sure, picked up as a, as a child. Um, yeah, uh, St Stravinsky was a believer, mm -hmm. was a devout Russian Orthodox. I mean, there was a period in his young years when he was not, but he became, he returned to the faith. Mm -hmm. uh, Prokofiev, we don't really know. Prokofiev didn't write any religious music. Sibelius didn't write any religious music. Brahms' religious music was not liturgical at all, and, um, and so on. So Schumann, I don't know to what extent uh, he was a believer or not. And Hector, what do you think Hector was? No, I think Hector was definitely not a yeah. believer. He, you know, he even says in the first page or two of his memoirs that, you know, uh, even though I have uh, ceased, I forget the words he uses, the, you know, the, uh, my have separated from the religion of my youth, um, you know, he, he talks about how the music he heard in church as a child was what actually started his, his love of music. He was very sarcastic. He says, now that the, the re, this charming religion, since it stopped burning people at the stake. <laughs> you know, 
Um, so I think he was not religious. Uh, you know, Verdi, we don't know whether Verdi really believed in God or not, but we know that he was anti organized or, religion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now I'd like to read from your Sibelius chapter again. And, and the piece that you picked is the fourth symphony, which is great because most people pick the second. So it allowed us to really explore the fourth. And I was gratified for that. And I did a lot of listening to it as I read your, your chapter. Um, but you write, but if we poke our noses into Sibelius's diary during the months in which he was at work on the fourth symphony, of what would be his seven published, seven published symphonies, we glimpse forms of insecurity that borders on bipolarity. So I'm going to read the entries. April 27, 1910. Again, in the deepest depression, working hard at the newcomer. May 2nd. Yesterday, a wonderful day, new ideas taking form. I have taken on a massive work. May 11th. Everything stagnant in the grip of a depression these days. August 12th. Worked well today on the development of the first movement. So we've jumped from May to August. Um, August 13th. Just remember this once and for all. You are a genius. You know it yourself. Feel it. Forget about the trivia. August 17th. Crossed out the whole of the development. August 30th. Inspired. The development is ready in my head. September 8th. Life is difficult again on account of mental lassitude, inability to work, and the disdain of others. September 15th, have had a sense of my own genius, worked on the third movement. September 17th, have doubts about the last movement of the symphony. November 24th, the miracle I am waiting for will never take place. I cannot work properly. November 26th, two days later, have been in ecstasy. December 13th through 15th, work and forge on the third movement, but I can't really concentrate properly. And so on through the end of 1910 and into the early months of 1911 until the fourth symphony's premiere, which took place in Helsinki with the composer conducting on April 3rd, 1911. Wow. What do you make of that? <laughs> <clears throat> I imagine that a lot of, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I know that, I mean, in my little way, when I'm working on a book, I sometimes have a feelings along those lines. I, I, I don't have depressive tendencies, uh, and I'm not a heavy drinker like <laughs> Sibelius, although he, had, he was not drinking when he was working on the Fourth Symphony. Um, but um, I know the feeling, you know, one day it's going and the next day, you know, you're thinking, you know, oh, my God, what's uh, what do I put in next? So um, it's very hard to I, I can understand what was going on. And, uh, you know, and he did write this fantastic, amazing symphony in the end. So. Um, you know, it was not uh, not one of his most popular works and not of success at first, but uh, some people like Ernest Newman grasped it right from the start, at least understood that there was something there that was very unusual. Um, so, yeah, you know, also, you know, don't forget that Sibelius, by the time he was working on that, Let's see, he was in his mid 40s. He was already kind of a national monument in Finland. And um, I think he had this added burden, psychological burden that, you know, great things were expected of him. Mm -hmm. Whereas a lot of composers, you know, especially in their early years uh, are, are sort of just trying to establish themselves to get some attention, any attention at all. Um, he was, on the contrary, having to live up to his reputation. And uh, I think that was very difficult for him. I was a friend of Pavarotti, as you know, and he told me that the hardest thing about his career was competing with his recordings. <laughs> people knew every recording so well of Nessun Dorma, La Donna Immobile, 
that when he came out on stage, he was afraid that they were not going to like his live performance as much as what they have burned into their imaginations or their brains, not their imaginations. Um, this, I, I've been circling around the question I'm about to ask you for an hour and a half. There are some people, I'm not taking a side here, I want your opinion, who feel that studying music and the experience of music should come in its purest form, in other words, the music. And there are other people who feel that we understand a lot more if we know the biographies of the people who created them. And this applies to, to actors and film directors and painters and all the creative areas. And if we know something about them, that it gives us a window into what they created and how they created it. This book strikes a balance in that the musical, musicologically inclined have plenty to nourish them, but also there is biography. And I never know, I, I sort of turn around and around on this for 50 years about whether I want to know about the creator, whether I don't, I wind up wanting to know, but sometimes I want to approach the work and then learn about the creator rather than the other way around. What is your approach, not just in this book, but in terms of your approach to studying music for yourself, but then teaching it to others? I think I personally, uh, I always wanted to know. <laughs> Even when I was a kid, I, I would, you know, if I was going to hear uh, one of the children's concerts, I would look up, we had a, an encyclopedia at home and I would look up the composers. I mean, obviously I didn't know in detail about their lives, but I would, I would try to find out something about them. Um, I don't think in a way that that influenced my likes and dislikes music, musically. I think that uh, music I, I love is music that I loved right away <laughs> for the most part, uh, you know, on getting to know it. I don't mean necessarily first hearing, but, you know, something that, that struck me right away. And then I wanted to know more. It was the follow up. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, for me personally, I think that knowing the more you know, the richer the experience, even let's say in a case like Wagner, who well, I was about to mention, the yeah. more you know about Wagner, yeah. you know, the less you like the guy for the most part. But I feel that I don't think that that should influence your approach to the music. And now, of course, we have this whole in in this country, we have, <clears throat> you know, uh, I know I'm treading on dangerous ground, but, you know, the cancel culture and so on. You know, where do you stop? If you're going to start uh, judging works of art by the behavior of the people who created those works of art, you're going to abolish just about every work of art ever created yeah. because nobody is spotless. And, you know, that's that's the truth of the matter. So, um, Rossini's not spotless. He had syphilis too, but I, mean, <laughs> I so think he was a he pretty got good it guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think he gave a lot more than he took. Well, they, they all they yeah. all <laughs> did in in the in the you know the lungo andare in the long yeah. run. Uh, you know, these are people whose works have survived this in many cases, despite who they were. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, being a Jew, I, I think, you know, if I'm going to eliminate all the anti-Semitic writers, composers, artists, and so on, that's, you know, it's going to be a massacre. We have Brahms, Verdi, and Zola. That's about it. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, what do you do with Dostoevsky? What do you do with Chopin? Not to, I mean, Wagner, of course, is the number one example. But, but uh, you know, these people who have their prejudices and limitations, as we all do, whether we admit it or not, 
um, you know, they're, they're people. Yeah. If they write or create things that exceed their own limitations as human beings, then, you know, let's take the work for what it is. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't, as I said, the very people who are criticizing now and and canceling and whatnot are there's not a single angel uh, in the whole crop yeah um again i quote gavazzini who said you know um he said i don't trust artists who claim to be ascetics mm -hmm. if either they're lying or they're bad artists <laughs> and uh you know i think that there's a lot of truth in, in I wish I had met him. We overlapped. I, I happen to be living in Milan when he was in his last years, but I just never had the occasion to meet him. He's a wonderful. And apparently, I'm the only person in New York who never met Stephen Sondheim. I've discovered, but I never, I never did. <laughs> you too. Um, finally, Harvey. I mean, you and I could speak in chapters and verses for <clears throat> decades at Wagnerian length, um, and with verity and consequence. But it happens that my favorite line that I found in your book, you quoted someone, but I've been living with it since I completed reading the book. The biographer of Hector Berlioz, Hugh McDonald, said that Berlioz's favorite theater is the imagination. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. What does that mean to you? I mean, I just adore that. Yeah, I think... I love Hector even more after reading that. Right. Well, you know, because... Uh, he had so many disappointments with his stage works in particular, uh, and obviously with Les Troyens above all. But um, in talking about The Damnation of Faust, which is the work that I've focused on in that chapter, you know, should it be done as an opera stage work or should it be done as a concert piece? It doesn't matter. You have to somehow or other, you know, if you're seeing it staged, focus on the music anyway. And if you're seeing it done as a concert piece with everybody just standing there, you can imagine the, the situations that are being illustrated musically. Um, I think part of, of the, what, among sorry. the many things I took away from that, I am tired of hearing about artificial intelligence, which to me, sounds so nauseating as a concept and that people want to actually embrace it. Uh, currently, the, every year the BBC sponsors some lectures by a scholar and I listen to them faithfully every December. And this year's lectures are about artificial intelligence and I'm not engaging. We have been given this gift of the brain and the mind and the individuality that goes with each one of our brains and minds that what unifies all the people you wrote about in this book and all the people perhaps that they encounter, but certainly the 10 composers, is their activation of their imagination and their ability to envision, to see, to plumb uh, what I read now with Sibelius and his creative process, but really all of these guys, even Stravinsky, um, relied heavily on the imagination. And Brahms, certainly in his way, as I said, I respect him and I'm working on it. I have <laughs> a way to go, but I'm working on it. But all the others are extraordinary. And I live in their work and their lives and I try to enter their imagination. And I'm grateful that they had it. Um, but really, not to name one, but I think that Hector's imagination was just in a very different place from the others. And that's part of the fascination for me. Mm -hmm. I'll happily enter all 10 of these guys and many, many more and women and yeah. so forth. But maybe part of the Berlioz gene that I claim to have, and I didn't ever think about this till now, is the way I engage with his imagination. Hmm. And I think that that's an interesting way to teach music or share music. We don't have to teach it always, uh, is to find whose imagination we really feel and enter yeah. and let it 
take us there. I think for many people that would be Beethoven, but anyone, frankly, can can take us there. And for me, it's Berlioz and others, but Berlioz. Mm -hmm. um, your book, I'll hold it up again, 10 <laughs> Masterpieces of Music, recently published, really became a stimulus for my imagination. And thank you. I'm I needed glad. the book. It made me sad, I won't <laughs> confess, but I really needed this book at this time to engage with these ideas. And I'm very grateful to you for that. So thank you very much. And thank you for taking the time to do this. Sure. Did I leave anything out? <laughs> <laughs> Offhand, I can't think of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I never ask people what they're working on next, but are you engaged in something that excites you? Yes, I'm actually working on a, a, a book about a composer I'd never really engaged with much at all before, Good. namely Schoenberg. Uh-huh. And uh, so had you done 12 composers, he would have been the 12. <laughs> <laughs> it, it would have sounded the 12th tone. In the <laughs> so, yes, I'm working on a short interpretive biography of Schoenberg. Uh -huh. and I, I'm because it took me a while to get the cogs moving, the whole mechanism going but now i i have to say i'm uh, i'm kind of fascinated by the subject and the whole background to his life and so on i a long time ago maybe 10 years ago i don't know wrote an article i can send you about schoenberg as a painter mm -hmm. because he was a very accomplished painter it's not that he yes. dabbled but i i mean i think gershwin was a pretty good painter but Maybe among all the composers, Schoenberg might have been the best painter. Well, Kandinsky uh, admired yeah. his work, so yeah. yeah, yeah. So therefore, I think it's interesting to approach him through the fact that he had connection to color, to form, and structure on the canvas, and not, I don't want to say simply, but not only on the musical page. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's that's a way into his imagination. Also, yeah. So, buon lavoro, as they say in Yiddish. Grazie. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to reading about Schoenberg and anything you do, frankly. I really always look forward to that. Thank you and, so much. And uh, one day the fog will lift and we'll be People able to... We'll get together again. Yeah. We'll get together again and we'll talk music and other things. Thank Great. you very much, Harvey Sachs. It was terrific. Thanks so much, Fred.